Junkie. Prologue. I was born in 1914 in a solid three-story brick house in a large Midwest city. My parents were comfortable. My father owned and ran a lumber business. The house had a lawn in front, a backyard with a garden, a fish pond, and a high wooden fence all around it. I remember the lamplighter lighting the gas street lights and the huge black shiny Lincoln and drives in the park on Sunday. All the props of a safe, comfortable way of life that is now gone forever. Actually, my earliest memories are colored by a fear of nightmares. I was afraid to be alone and afraid of the dark and afraid to go to sleep because of dreams where a supernatural horror seemed always on the point of taking shape. I was afraid someday the dream would still be there when I woke up. I recall hearing a maid talk about opium and how smoking opium brings sweet dreams. And I said, I will smoke opium when I grow up. I was subject to hallucinations as a child. Once I woke up in the early morning light and saw little men playing in a blockhouse I had made. I felt no fear, only a feeling of stillness and wonder. Another recurrent hallucination, or nightmare, concerned animals in the wall and started with the delirium of a strange, undiagnosed fever that I had at the age of four or five. I went to a progressive school with the future solid citizens, the lawyers, doctors, and businessmen of a large Midwest town. I was timid with the other children and afraid of physical violence. One aggressive little lesbian would pull my hair whenever she saw me. I would like to shove her face in right now, but she fell off a horse and broke her neck years ago. When at about seven, my parents decided to move to the suburbs to get away from people. They bought a large house with grounds and woods and a fish pond where there were squirrels instead of rats. They lived there in a comfortable capsule with a beautiful garden and cut off from contact with the life of the city. I went to a private suburban high school. I was not conspicuously good or bad at sports, neither brilliant nor backward in studies. I had a definite blind spot for mathematics or anything mechanical. I never liked competitive team games and avoided these whenever possible. I became, in fact, a chronic malingerer. I did like fishing, hunting, and hiking. I read more than was usual for an American boy of that time and place. Oscar Wilde, Anatole France, Baudelaire, even Gide. I formed a romantic attachment for another boy, and we spent our Saturdays exploring old quarries, riding around on bicycles, and fishing in ponds and rivers. At this time, I was greatly impressed by an autobiography of a burglar called You Can't Win. The author claimed to have spent a good part of his life in jail. It sounded good to me compared with the dullness of a Midwest suburb where all contact with life was shut out. The environment was empty, the antagonist hidden, and I drifted into solo adventures. My criminal acts were gestures, unprofitable, and for the most part, unpunished. I would break into houses and walk around without taking anything. As a matter of fact, I had no need for money. Sometimes I would drive around in the country with a twenty-two rifle shooting chickens. I made the roads unsafe 
with reckless driving until an accident from which I emerged miraculously and pretentiously unscratched scared me into normal caution. I went to one of the big three universities where I majored in English literature for lack of interest in any other subject. I hated the university and I hated the town it was in. Everything about the place was dead. The university was a fake English setup taken over by the graduates of fake English public schools. I was lonely. I knew no one, and strangers were regarded with distaste by the closed corporation of the desirables. By accident, I met some rich homosexuals of the international queer set who cruise around the world bumping into each other in queer joints from New York to Cairo. I saw a way of life, a vocabulary, references, a whole symbol system, as the sociologists say. But these people were jerks for the most part. And after an initial period of fascination, I cooled off on the setup. When I graduated without honors, I had $150 per month in trust. That was in the Depression, and there were no jobs, and I couldn't think of any job I wanted in any case. I drifted around Europe for a year or so. Remnants of the post-war decay lingered in Europe. U.S. dollars could buy a good percentage of the inhabitants of Austria, male or female. That was in 1936, and the Nazis were closing in fast. I went back to the States. With my trust fund, I could live without working or hustling. I was still cut off from life as I had been in the Midwest suburb. I pulled around taking graduate courses in psychology and jiu-jitsu lessons. I decided to undergo psychoanalysis and continued with it for three years. Analysis removed inhibitions and anxiety so that I could live the way I wanted to live. Much of my progress in analysis was accomplished in spite of my analyst, who did not like my orientation, as he called it. He finally abandoned analytic objectivity and put me down as an out-and-out calm. I was more pleased with results than he was. After being rejected on physical grounds from five officer training programs, I was drafted into the Army and certified fit for unlimited service. I decided I was not going to like the Army and copped out on my nuthouse record. I once got on a Van Gogh kick and cut off a finger joint to impress someone who interested me at the time. The nuthouse doctors had never heard of Van Gogh. They put me down for schizophrenia, adding paranoid type to explain the upsetting fact that I knew where I was and who was president of the U.S. When the Army saw that diagnosis, they discharged me with a notation. This man is never to be recalled or reclassified. After parting company with the Army, I took a variety of jobs. You could have about any job you wanted at that time. I worked as a private detective, an exterminator, a bartender. I worked in factories and offices. I played around the edges of crime. But my $150 per month was always there. I did not have to have money. It seemed a romantic extravagance to jeopardize my freedom by some token act of crime. It was at this time and under these circumstances that I came in contact with junk, became an addict, and thereby gained 
the motivation, the real need for money I had never had before. The question is frequently asked, why does a man become a drug addict? The answer is that he usually does not intend to become an addict. You don't wake up one morning and decide to be a drug addict. It takes at least three months shooting twice a day to get any habit at all. You don't really know what junk sickness is until you have had several habits. It took me almost six months to get my first habit, and then the withdrawal symptoms were mild. I think it's no exaggeration to say it takes about a year and several hundred injections to make an addict. The questions, of course, could be asked. Why did you ever try narcotics? Why did you continue using it long enough to become an addict? You become a narcotics addict because you do not have strong motivations in any other direction. Junk wins by default. I tried it as a matter of curiosity. I drifted along, taking shots when I could score. I ended up hooked. Most addicts I have talked to report a similar experience. They did not start using drugs for any reason they can remember. They just drifted along until they got hooked. If you have never been addicted, you can have no clear idea what it means to need junk with the addict's special need. You don't decide to be an addict. One morning you wake up sick, and you are an addict. I have never regretted my experience with drugs. I think I am in better health now as a result of using junk at intervals than I would be if I had never been an addict. Junk is a cellular equation that teaches the user facts of general validity. I've learned a great deal from using junk. I've seen life measured out in eyedroppers of morphine solution. I experienced the agonizing deprivation of junk sickness and the pleasure of relief when junk-thirsty cells drank from the needle. Perhaps all pleasure is relief. I have learned the cellular stoicism that junk teaches the user. I have seen a cell full of sick junkies, silent and immobile in separate misery. They knew the pointlessness of complaining or moving. They knew that basically no one can help anyone else. There is no key, no secret someone else has that he can give you. I've learned the junk equation. Junk is not, like alcohol or weed, a means to increased enjoyment of life.